Thank you. Amber Scora is the author of the moving memoir, Leaving the Witness, which details her experience growing up as Jehovah's Witness, moving to China to become a missionary, coming and coming to question the beliefs that she had been taught and eventually leaving that religion. After suffering the tragic loss of her three-month-old son, Amber became a parental leave advocate, bringing this issue to the forefront of the 2016 presidential campaign. She also penned an op-ed in the New York Times entitled, Surviving the Death of My Son After the Death of My Faith. You may have heard her on NPR's Fresh Air with Terry Gross, or on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, or even on FFRF's radio show and podcast. <laughs> Oprah Magazine said that Leaving the Witness is one of the best books of summer, and the New York Times called it one of 12 new books to watch. Amber is a Canadian writer living in Brooklyn, New York. She's been published in the New York Times, USA Today, Gothamist.com, The Globe and Mail, and Believer Magazine. She's also recently delivered a TED Talk. We invited Amber here to speak today because we were blown away by her memoir, the poignancy of her writing, and her intellectual integrity. Of course, we have copies of her books for sale at the front tables if there are any left, and Amber will be signing them in the ballroom at 5 p.m. after Representative Mark Pocan's talk. Please join me in welcoming Amber Scora. First of all, I have to say it is amazing to be here because I was raised a Jehovah's Witness uh, and women were never allowed to give talks. So, first time. <laughs> so it's my guess that probably everyone in this room has either known a Jehovah's Witness or been preached to by one. I probably don't even have to raise hands. But so many people I've noticed, don't, they feel like they don't really understand what Jehovah's Witnesses are about. Um, why there isn't more information from ex-members out there. So I thought I'd share a little bit about that first. So Jehovah's Witnesses fly under the greater cultural radar in a large part because of the way that their own culture is set up. Uh, as a Jehovah's Witness, you're raised, or if you convert later in life, which is rare but happens, taught to believe that you have to keep separate from the world. So this is why Jehovah's Witnesses don't vote, they don't get involved in charity work, um, they don't get too close to people who are what they consider worldly or non-Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyone who's worldly is considered part of Satan's world and therefore bad association. Growing up as a Jehovah's Witness from a very young age, this meant that I was just taught that I was different. And this was reinforced by many of the arbitrary things that Jehovah's Witnesses pull out of the Bible and pronounce as necessary for salvation. Um, you may have heard that they don't allow people to take blood transfusions, so that would mean that if you ever were in a medical emergency, you would have to accept death over this life-saving medical treatment. But it also meant for a kid growing up that on hot dog day, because some hot dogs, at least back in the 80s when I was growing up, had blood in them, and so we'd have to have special, we were the special hot dog eaters. Our moms would cook our hot dogs separately from the other kids in the school. And there were other things that made us feel really different. We didn't celebrate Christmas or any other holidays, and um, we would have to sit outside the gym if there was carol singing. Um, if someone had a birthday in our classroom, then we wouldn't be able to have the cake. Um, it was all in all quite a boring childhood. <laughs> we couldn't date or marry anyone that was not a Jehovah's Witness, and we were strongly advised not to go to college or establish any kind of career. And the reason for this was is because Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the world is about to end any day. And so we have to save as many people as we can before Armageddon. So you don't see many books by people like me who leave the religion. First of all, because none of us realize that we can actually write, because we're always taught not to do anything except preach. But also because the leaders strongly forbid anyone from airing the dirty laundry of the organization. So this will apply to very minor issues. For example, if, say, you were in a congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses and someone uh, cheated you out of some money in a business deal, you were discouraged from taking them to court. And it extended to also very serious issues, such as child sexual abuse in the congregations. If, a child, if there was an accusation that a child was molested, 
they, parents would be discouraged from going to the police and they would be told that it would be better to handle this matter internally in the congregations. And often it wasn't. The idea behind this was that the most important thing was that God's chosen people be protected. They didn't want God to look bad, essentially. <laughs> of course, you might think when a person leaves the religion, like me, well, then you're no longer bound by this rule to not speak about the religion or criticize it in any way, right? But what happens when you leave the Jehovah's Witnesses is that you are swiftly shunned. And that is quite a severe punishment for people who, as I mentioned, are taught to build their life around this organization. All of your friends and usually all of your family are witnesses as well. And therefore, as a result, you have very few ties in the real world. Now, this shunning is bad enough, but if a person takes it one step further and speaks out about the organization, say, in a book, <laughs> or in any other public way, <laughs> Whether it be to someone on the inside or outside, that person is labeled an apostate. Now, of course, we know this is a very loaded word and it means different things to different people. But as a Jehovah's Witness, the term apostate is a very scary brand to receive. Apostasy in uh, our congregations, in our literature, according to our leaders, was the one sin that God would never forgive. It was worse on the scale of sin than being a murderer or a child abuser, because it was the one sin that God would not forgive. Every week at our meetings that I attended my whole life and in our literature, apostates like me now would be described in very terrifying terms. These were people who were mentally diseased, criminals, dogs that had returned to their own vomit, lower than a snake with characteristics like the devil. Apostates were said to be like gangrene that needed to be swiftly amputated. Identity is a weird thing. Even myself, when I wrote my book, I had already been out of the religion around that time, around eight years, and I didn't believe in it anymore. But the power of a community lasts longer sometimes than even a belief. And even after you've left a community, the way that your old community, even if they don't speak to you anymore, looks at you, it has a big effect on you. The last thing that I wanted to be was this horrible apostate character that I had been warned about. I didn't want to be seen that way by people I had loved. But yet, obviously I got over it. <laughs> Here I am out in Satan's world. I don't think I'm mentally diseased, but you be the judge. <laughs> so how did I get here? Well, the path to finding my freedom was a weird one. It was, I was in one of the most restrict, restrictive countries in the world, China. When I was in my 20s, after spending years knocking on doors in my home city of Vancouver, Canada, to not much results, you all know what you do when a Jehovah's Witness calls, so I blame all of you. <laughs> But I decided I was going to get out of there. I was going to learn Mandarin Chinese and travel to China to preach. China was the one place, or one of the places, that had not yet received a witness because religion, for the large part, as we know, is illegal there. So Jehovah's Witnesses hadn't really preached there either. I wanted to give these people who had never had a chance to convert before a chance to survive Armageddon and then being killed for being non-believers. Now, ironically, it was in China that for the first time in my life, I had a little bit of freedom, which I realized should have probably been the first sign that something was wrong, because most people do not go to China and feel more free. <laughs> but it was different for me, because at home, my life revolved around my religion. Like, week in, week out, we had study and meetings, and all of my friends were witnesses, and we were so busy, we didn't even really have time to think. In China, because the work was done underground, being illegal, the structure was not there. There wasn't so many meetings, and to preach, there wasn't other brothers and sisters that I would go out with as I did at home. We were given instructions when we arrived in China of how to do our work, and then basically left on our own to be Jehovah's Witnesses there. Now, you have to understand that though I had a bit of freedom, I mean, it was, it did feel exciting, but obviously there was something latent in me that there was, you know, tending to be gravitating to this kind of um, 
freedom. But my aim at first was to preach. I was a true believer. I took the mission seriously. But that, too, looked different because back at home, as I said, witnesses didn't really make friends with people on the outside. But in China, that was how we did our work. We would first make friends with people and sometimes for a long time get to know them on a sort of casual basis. But what we were really doing was vetting them to see if they were members of the Communist Party or if they were safe enough to reveal our real reason for wanting to be their friends. Often that vetting process took a long time because you were trying to act natural and you know, bringing in the Bible, you know, just dropping the Bible in conversation at the best of times is not really like a normal thing to do, but in China it's super weird. <laughs> but the byproduct of this was that for the first time in my life I had started to make some worldly friends for the first time and get to know people who weren't Jehovah's Witnesses on a pretty intimate level. Preaching, too, in a language like Mandarin was different. But after a few years, when I really knew enough Chinese to carry on conversations and conduct these Bible studies that we would do in Mandarin, you know, I would sit across from these Chinese students that I had, teaching them this truth that I had held as my firm faith for my whole life. And it was almost as if, for the first time, using this new language that almost required you to excavate your mind in order to speak, I could hear what I was saying. I was sitting across from these people with thousands of years of cultural history and wisdom and telling them to trade it in for my 100 or, year or so year old new American religion. And it started to feel a little crazy. Eventually, the mild disorientation of being in this new culture and speaking this language so different than my own opened up cracks in my faith. And the physical distance from my community gave me a mental break from the constant meetings and indoctrination. Slowly, a worldly friendship I had begun to engage in with a client at my workplace ended up with me questioning everything that I had been raised with and eventually leaving the religion. There are a lot of juicy details to that story, but I, that's better for a book than a talk. <laughs> now, a lot of people who have never been religious wonder why anyone, any reasonably intelligent person would stay in a group like this that is so obviously to people on the outside wrong or culty even. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the inside scoop on cults. So here's the thing. No one who is in a cult ever thinks they're in a cult. You think you're living your best life, and I have to say that in some ways, it is a great life. I mean, you having the answers to all of life's disturbing questions is really relaxing. <laughs> you have no angst, you don't worry about climate change, you don't have to have a retirement fund, the world is ending. Armageddon, God is gonna solve all of those problems. Plus, you have many wonderful friends and your family in it with you, and you have this really warm community, and that's something that is hard to imagine stepping outside of for most of us. Two, you're constantly told how awful people's lives are on the outside, and because you're only allowed to be close with people on the inside, you have no way of verifying otherwise. And of course, the world can be quite a scary place, like especially right now, so it's an easy message to sell. Of course, you meet nice people at work and on the street and such, but you know that they are going to die at Armageddon, so how great can that be? <laughs> yeah, it isn't until you start to try to leave a cult that you realize you might be in a cult. When the people in your organization and family members immediately shun you for questioning even one of the teachings from the leaders, which teachings themselves have changed over the years, you know that you might be in some sort of cult. Later, after I left the religion, I found stronger proof that something was off. The first boyfriend I had when I left China and moved to New York, um, he had an unheated loft in Brooklyn, and one winter we just watched every documentary on YouTube about cults and cult members who had left. I don't know why he did that. I think back now and think, 
maybe I was a little bit weird, and he was, it was a message. <laughs> he was trying to help me <laughs> normalize. But I was surprised as I watched because every cult, every cult member that was interviewed after the disintegration of their belief system, from the most extreme, Jonestown, people dying, Jim Jones, to the less extreme, where they didn't mandate death, well, these people's story was exactly my story. Entirely in different belief systems, but the same systems in place to keep people in. My lines of reasoning, my thought patterns, my thought blocking, the us versus them, black versus white thinking. All the things that we had been trained to do to stay in the religion, to save our lives, were the same things that people in these cults had been trained to do. And while the witnesses are not as extreme as some groups, they do mandate that people die rather than take life-saving blood transfusions. So while they're not drinking Kool-Aid, they are mandating death for no reason, which to me is not that different. There was more. I could go on, but I won't. But the point being, it takes a lot of deprogramming to realize that the religion you were raised with as truth is simply a mythology something passed down, in my case, from generation to generation. Something that started with somewhat good intentions, perhaps, but morphed to enable the survival and the expansion of the group, to consolidate the power of the organization to the point that everything else was second place. And while many of the individuals in my old organization were loving, humane, wonderful people, it's like the organization itself becomes a machine with traits that are cold and inhumane and just wrong at times, and then this rubs off onto the people. This seems to be a pattern I have noticed in many religious institutions. Now, is there some cautionary tale in my story? Uh, something I've learned having been on both sides of the fence here, being very religious and now being not religious? Well, I could say a few things. Even given all that I have lost, which is family, friends, my purpose in life, you know, a lot of time that I could have used to do other things or pursue other things, I have never once regretted waking up and leaving. <clears throat> and I've never heard any other ex-Jehovah's Witness or other ex-religious person who's been in a group like this saying anything different. I know people who have lost their own grown children to the religion. They taught them this religion. The kids grew up. The parents realized, oh, this is not the truth. They left, and now their own children won't speak to them because they think of them as an apostate. I know people who have lost their livelihood, everything. And yet, they're still so grateful to be out. I think this really, to me, speaks to the value of having freedom, of having the mental freedom to be who one is. I think it, in my own life, I can see that this is just such a, a human need and a human right, really. Now, that said, on the other side, now that I shed one of a very controlling belief system, it's a lot easier for me to see cultiness everywhere I look. I can't even take a yoga class without <laughs> Being like, are you the leader and I'm the follower? <laughs> but the fact is, we are all of us subject to indoctrination of some form, whether we realize it or not. And obviously, some belief systems are more extreme than others. But we all have blind spots. We're born into a family and a culture that teaches us certain values and ideals right from birth. And all of us have embedded ideas about way, the way that life should look or how the world should be. It could be anything from what's normal, that we you know, get, go to college, get married, have children, live in a house, or that we elect a president that looks a certain way, AKA a white man. <laughs> we're part of communities. We're part of political parties. We're human beings, so we're tribal by nature. And while groups we need them, we need communities. We also have to be aware of our tendency towards siloed thinking. We have a tendency to align with our group. We like to be around people who think the way we think. We other people who are different. We cancel people whose opinions we don't like. It's happening more and more. 
This is most obvious in the religious realm, but it's also the case in the political realm, in social circles, on the internet, in scientific communities, and any other realm where people identify with a way of thinking. This is why cults exist. They're just, to me, a manifestation of the extreme end of something that is in us all. It's a continuum. And I say all of this to say that I've learned that I have to check my own thinking to ensure that I'm not succumbing to my own cult-like tendencies that are part of me as a human being. And how do we do this? I have no idea. <laughs> but I do have some ideas, um, just from my own experience. Um, I think it's important to make friends with people who don't think like us. And that may sound trite, um, but in my story, if you remember, or I gave you some, a few details, but what made it possible for me to leave was that I did open myself up to a close relationship with someone that was the other. I didn't believe everything that he told me he believed, and I still don't, but the differences between us were what made it possible for me to see that not everything I had been taught to believe by my culture was absolute truth, even if it had seemed to add up. Allowing myself to get close to someone so different than me was what made me see that. And it wasn't always pleasant to see those things, but I'm really grateful that I didn't back away or dismiss him. Also, I think there's another thing to think about is that I find for myself it's really easy for me to get into Twitter arguments um, with people on the other side. But um, I think it's much easier to argue and be polarized on Twitter. But if you have a relationship with someone, you're much more inclined to challenge each other in meaningful ways. It goes both ways. So I think ultimately we need each other. We're social creatures, but we need our differences too. I've also learned this, that when we feel we're really sure that we're right, that's always a sign that, to me that I need to look deeper and question my strongest assumptions, to not be dogmatic about anything. It doesn't mean that we're not right, but we have to be open to the possibility that what we hold dear is not 100% true or right all of the time. Life is complicated. And finally, never let your identity be identity be too hijacked by a group or a belief. I think it's really important to step outside our comfort zone and put ourselves in positions that make us feel off kilter because that's when we get opened up and that's when we learn new things. I say to this day that if I had not gone to China, I would most definitely still be a Jehovah's Witness. I bet that's probably the only person who's ever said that in the history of mankind. <laughs> okay. So there's one postscript to my story, um, which was mentioned in the introdu introduction. And this is not really exactly about religion, but it is kind of about my story of religion. And that is that seven years after I left my religion, I experienced a great tragedy. My child, who was almost four months old, Carl, died on his first day in childcare. <laughs> now, I raise this because many people who know my religious background um, have asked me whether this kind of terrible, like unbearable loss made me want to go back to religion. And I think it's an interesting question. So just to set the framework for where I was when I gave birth to my son, I had already, after seven years, overcome a lot of obstacles by the time he came along. It hadn't been easy to start a new life outside my religion. But the one thing that I had not prepared myself for post-religion was a tragedy like this. I hadn't thought about what it would be like to experience loss without faith. I don't think anyone can really be prepared for the loss of a child, but it blindsided me. I think that I thought on some level that there was like some quota of difficulties that you would go through in your life and that after so much loss already that I had experienced and so much pain, that now everything, somehow the universe would stretch out before me and be good and kind and just and nothing bad would happen. But of course it's not that orderly. When my son died, I was faced with an entirely foreign landscape, death without hope of an afterlife grief without the comfort of religion. I say this because I knew grief with religion. My father had died when I was 18, when I was a Jehovah's Witness. 
And I was sad, but I wasn't that sad because I was certain that one day I would see him again in paradise. Religion was born for things like this, for death, for tragedy. It's the ultimate escape from it. My faith, I realize now, looking back, had acted as a buffer to many of these very difficult things of being human, the more devastating emotions of what we had to experience in life. And now, when I lost my son, without that faith, I just experienced his death as nothingness. A child so full of promise, health, and energy, and future just vanished. It was beyond my ability to understand or to accept. And it was the ultimate test for someone who had once had belief. So when people asked if I was tempted to go back to my religion, I could honestly say that if belief were a choice, there are definitely times where I would have chosen it. Because as I said, it was comforting to just turn off the emotions I didn't want to feel, to just believe that there was something else that would resolve them for me. But the truth was is that there was now no believing what I now knew to be a myth at best, a lie at worst, and trying to believe something that you know to be false is not comforting. But let me tell you what I discovered about grief without religion. It has some surprising byproducts. I now had no choice but to live with the reality of loss, to deal with what was in front of me. At first, what was in front of me was just utter darkness on every level. But once you have been that close to death, especially that kind of death, the death of a child, something else happens when you can't escape it by thinking about paradise or heaven or somewhere else. And that is that you become deeply attuned and deeply grateful to life. In the midst of this kind of grief that is so all-encompassing where you have no escape, you're forced to experience an even deeper pain, but you also become more clear-eyed about life. And I found that I started to see, like to my utter surprise, that there were glimpses of beautiful things in this suffering. Um, some of those things were the memories I had of my son, which, you know, when you look after a newborn baby for almost four months, you, as a mother, I've spent every minute with him, and the, the memories became just seared in, in, in my mind, and they were so meaningful and so beautiful. And the other thing that I encountered and focused on and noticed was the depth of care and compassion and empathy that came from the fellow human beings around me. People that were friends and people that I didn't know alike. You don't see this every day. You're crowd I'm from New York, so like, you know, I use the analogy of you're crowded in a subway and everyone's a jerk. Um, you get cut off by annoying drivers where you drive cars. It's easy to forget that we all, as human beings, possess this deep humanity. But when I was in such great pain, so many people, both strangers and friends alike, got me through by showing me love in many ways. And it was the strangest thing to experience such an awful thing and yet be touched by beauty and love. Now time has gone by and without the escape of belief, I've learned more. I've learned how to live with everyone's worst nightmare and I'm still alive, which sometimes feels like a feat. And I've learned how patience and endurance and how to tolerate devastating feelings because that's what living without your child requires. Someone once told me that great grief is like a character test, and it does feel like that. It takes all my energy not to devolve into anger and jealousy and feelings of why me. But since I do not believe that my son is out there somewhere or will come back to me, it's meant that I've kept him alive in ways in the here and now. And one way I did that was becoming an activist for paid parental leave. And through this work, I found that death without hope didn't have to be death without faith. And how so? It's because activism can be an act of faith. A faith that when there are problems, that we as human beings can find ways to solve them. And a faith that others would join me in a fight for what was right, and they did. 
In my own religion, old religion, we were taught not to put our faith in man, but if humankind is all we have, or at least all that's available to us at this time, perhaps this faith that we can change the world is not misplaced. That's what I've learned, and I'm not willing to give up hope yet. I think many of us have all suffered loss, all of us have suffered loss, and we can relate to this. I don't have all the answers now, but I can say that I appreciate the deep mystery of it all, and I feel the magic of life all around me in this power of our shared humanity, and I feel deep gratitude, and it's been very lovely to be here with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you.